lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. I did sit down with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu today. We had a wide-ranging conversation about the clashes yesterday, about Israel's now open warfare with Iran, and the future of any potential peace process. Looking back on yesterday, especially Gaza, anything you would have done differently? Well, I wish that it wouldn't have happened at all. I mean, Hamas is pushing people with a view of a massive infiltration into Israel, openly declaring their goal is to destroy Israel. They're paying these people. So it's, it's not the peaceful demonstration uh, that you think about. You say they're paying them to? Yes. To try to cross the border. Hamas is paying these people who are coming there. They're pushing civilians, women, children into the line of fire with a view of getting casualties. We try to minimize casualties. They're trying to incur casualties in order to, uh, uh, in order to put pressure on Israel, which is horrible. You say they want kids to die. Yes. Putting kids in the line of fire. Yes. Did your army go too far? I don't know of any army who would do anything differently if you had to protect your border against people who say, we're going to destroy you and we're going to flood into your country. You try other means. You try all sorts of means. You try uh, non-lethal means and they don't work. So you're left with uh, bad choices. It's a bad deal. You know, you try and you, you go for below the knee and sometimes it doesn't work. And uh, unfortunately, these things are avoidable. If Hamas had not pushed them there, then nothing would happen. Will you target Hamas leaders at this point? We don't think that anyone is immune if they, uh, if they dispatch uh, terrorists to kill us. Do you see yourself under any circumstance talking to Hamas? As long as they seek our destruction, what am I going to talk about? I mean, if somebody said, could you talk to Al-Qaeda? Would you, talk, would you have discussions with bin Laden about what? I ask only because, against all odds, the, the U.S. and North Korea seem to be on the verge of, of talking. So sometimes meetings that might be unimaginable end up happening. You're right. It's happened uh, to us with our Arab neighbors. But that's when you have leaders who decided that they abandoned the goal of uh, war and destruction and annihilating the other side. And by the way, even what has happened in North Korea, that took place because of a very clear message, I think, that North Korea received, that the goal of destruction and aggression would be met with very strong, a very strong response. Are you at war with Iran? They're at war with us. We never sought any enmity with Iran. They openly declared that their goal is to annihilate us every day. It's open war, though, now, more so well, than it was before. Well, because what, what has happened is that Iran moved a part of its army into Syria with new weapons that are specifically aimed at being fired at us. So obviously, what choice do we have? We try to defend ourselves. If they restart the nuclear program and in fact pick up the pace, hmm. will you launch strikes? I've said that we will not let Iran um, develop a nuclear weapon and I stand by that. That means an attack? It means we will not let them do it. We have a variety of means, as you saw. Do you see peace in your lifetime? I see it already now. We have peace with uh, Egypt. We have peace with Jordan. Peace with the Palestinians? Yes, I think it's possible. Not with those Palestinians like Hamas who call for our destruction, but I see peace with any, uh, any one of our neighbors who's willing to live in peace. I think, yes, I think it's possible. 
Netanyahu enjoys a very close relationship with President Trump. The president had tasked his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, with handling any peace talks, potentially. We have not seen a Kushner plan, though. And now that Mike Pompeo is Secretary of State, he has given every indication he wants to be involved. So it does not appear any new peace process gets rolling anytime soon. It'll be interesting to see how all of this unfolds. Jeff, what is Netanyahu's main priority now? Uh, he would tell you security, uh, and he's trying to manage that on many fronts right now. Israel is involved in the two areas nearby, uh, Gaza and the West Bank. They are now also engaging Iran militarily in significant ways. I asked Netanyahu about this, whether he believes his military is overcommitted. He told us, quote, Israel has been here before. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio, here live with James Jacob Prash. It is May 25th. And it's time for This Week in Prophecy. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Wonderful to be with you back here in the UK or wherever you are listening from. This Week in Prophecy. And quite a week it is being. The world is recovering from President Trump's announcement that he would be canceling the scheduled June 12th meeting in Singapore with Kim Jong-un, the son of Kim Jong-il, the crazed hyperstall on a demagogue, dictator of North Korea, human rights abuser, persecutor of Christians, and all-around bad guy. President Trump canceling the summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. In a letter to Kim, Trump writing, quote, Sadly, based on the tremendous anger and open hostility displayed in your most recent statement, I feel it is inappropriate at this time to have this long-planned meeting. Trump adding, quote, you talk about your nuclear capabilities, but ours are so massive and powerful that I pray to God they will never have to be used. Despite the fiery rhetoric, Trump calling this a missed opportunity and said someday he still hoped to meet Kim. The letter follows explosive comments from North Korea. On Thursday, North Korea's vice foreign minister lashed out at U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, calling him ignorant, stupid, and a political dummy, after Pence warned that North Korea may end like Libya in a civil war, where then-leader Muammar Gaddafi was killed by rebels in 2011, years after giving up its nuclear program. The high-ranking North Korean also warned that Pyongyang could make the U.S. quote, taste an appalling tragedy and that they would not beg Washington for dialogue. This comes as North Korea on Thursday said it blew up its tunnels used for nuclear testing. The Pungi Re nuclear test site beneath Mount Mantap in the northeast of the country is where Pyongyang conducted all six of its nuclear weapons tests. Dozens of foreign journalists were on hand to witness the event, but international inspectors were not invited. Mr. Trump did show grace, but he did not show weakness. Now, what has stood out in the world's eyes, whether we like it or not, and there are people complaining of the America First attitude and policy of the Trump administration as compared to that of his predecessor, Mr. Obama, Mr. Kerry, and Hillary Clinton, including the Bishop Michael Kerry, who performed the royal wedding for the American grade B movie star, whatever she is, uh, not to demean her, Meghan Merkel, to Princess, uh, to uh, Prince Harry here in Britain. That same clergyman has, of course, denounced Mr. Trump's America First policies in favor of globalism. There is a British version of British First or Britain First piloted by Nigel Farage and other such movements in other countries, certainly Benjamin Netanyahu in Israel. Now, putting the people who elected you in your national interests first is not necessarily mean that you don't care about other countries or other nations. Mr. Trump has demonstrated that repeatedly, and he certainly demonstrated it within the last two weeks. Nonetheless, now we have religion being used as another platform to attack Mr. Trump's policies. Uh, these people are obviously irked by his friendship to Israel and his hostility towards radical Islam, and that includes the theologically, numerically, uh, and certainly spiritually and morally declining Church of England. 
Um, may it rest in peace. In fact, may it drop dead first so that it may rest in peace because it no longer has any viable purpose in the service of Christ anywhere in Great Britain. It is a dead religion. It is a dead church that has no moral or theological standards anymore. Nonetheless, let us look at what has happened. Mr. Trump was not played for a stooge the way the North Koreans played Jimmy Carter for a stooge, played Obama for a stooge, even to a degree played Bush for a stooge. They made concessions, get the remunerations and benefits they want, and then break the deal and lie and continue business as usual. Mr. Trump made it clear, if it happens, it happens. He's prepared to walk away from the deal. Over the last 10 days, the North Koreans have demanded the cancellation of something they originally agreed to scheduled military exercises between the United States and South Korea, which the Trump White House canceled at the request of Mr. Moon and the South Koreans, who are anxious to have a diplomatic resolution, understandably, with North Korea. But Mr. Trump basically said, not going to play the same old game. It has to be something real and realistic and honest, or it's not going to happen. In this, there were complaints and fears by North Korea, allegedly, of the mention some time ago of a Libya-type situation for North Korea. The North Koreans interpreted this to mean not simply the denuclearization of North Korea as took place under Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, but also regime change, which was not necessarily the implication of the American remarks. Nonetheless, the North Koreans began pouting wavering, threatening to cancel, and Mr. Trump just said, I'm not going to play this game. You want to negotiate, get back to me at some future time, but not now. The North Koreans have responded by playing the victim, saying we're willing to meet any time, any place. They say one thing, they do another. This has caused some political distraught in South Korea, however, where the society remains divided against an anti-communist line and a line that is more reconciliatory that is embodied by the government of Mr. Moon. In Japan, Mr. Abe's government, because it has been the victim of so much aggression by North Korea, supports a much harder line and is more in tune with Mr. Trump. Now, the prophetic significance of these things is not direct of anything in scripture in any overt way, except that Iran and North Korea have been in nuclear cooperation in the development of weapons programs and ballistic missiles. And it may have ramifications for that. But it has created a buttressing climate of America first. America has acted in a way that the Obama administration did not with North Korea. It has acted in a way directly contrary to the way the Obama administration did with Iran, which is of tremendous prophetic significance. We know, of course, that when American naval servicemen were seized by the Iranians at gunpoint, made to kneel down with their hands on their heads, that the Obama administration secretly took $400 million of American money and paid ransom for those captured American seamen in order to get them back instead of standing up to Iran. This is Barack Obama's sellout and betrayal of American interest, the national humiliation. Well, the North Koreans know they can't play that game anymore, and so do the Iranians know they cannot play that game. So let's begin with this week in prophecy. The F-35, as we reported approximately three weeks ago, flown by Israeli pilots with advanced American and Israeli avionics packages, made experimental incursions into Iranian airspace. We also know from briefings by the Israeli Air Force High Command that Israel has been practicing for attacks on possibly Tehran by flying over Beirut and other possible targets. For some time, well over two years, Israeli F-15s have been in secret cooperation with Greece and Cyprus, been flying to Greece and back to Israel in simulated air attack exercises going a co-equal distance in the opposite direction of what it would take for the Israelis to carry out airstrikes against Iran. 
Well, so it continues. But this week, in prophecy, it has been formulated that following Mr. Trump's warnings and Mr. Pompeo's warnings, that if Iran resumes its nuclear weapons development capacity, there will be a response. F-35s, but also now for the first time, Jericho-3 missiles carrying 750 kilograms of ordnance launched by Israel are indeed capable of hitting the Tanz, Isfahan, and Iraq, the three key Iranian nuclear facilities for the development of nuclear armaments. This week in prophecy was also disclosed that an American University think tank and research center as well as undoubtedly the Pentagon and CIA, have data of an Iranian development project for long-range intercontinental ballistic missiles with the eventual aim of being able to hit the United States from Iran. This is something that the United States and certainly the Trump administration would find very, very threatening. If the Israelis were to use the Jericho 3 missile, there would be no pilot risk, no need for refueling or the political negotiations that would go with it with the Saudi Arabians and so forth. If enrichment does continue, Iran has fully deployed Bavar 347 anti-aircraft missile systems. But again, the Israelis have been well experimenting as how to evade them and carry out airstrikes despite them. Watch this space. The United States and Israel both have contingency plans if Iran seeks to reactivate its nuclear development weapons program. United States has also struck Homs. It was not Israel, as was originally speculated last week, but reported this week in prophecy, near the border of Iraq, close to the city of Al-Qasar. Twelve Assad or pro-Assad combatants were reported killed, but Syrian spokesmen have claimed that the missile aggression, as they described it, was met with interception. Anyway, the United States is still actively attacking targets not only in Iraq, but attacking targets inside Syria that are in the Assad camp and homes, a military airport closer to the Iraqi border is where it happened and is reported this week in prophecy. Following the briefing by Israeli General Amikam Norkin about the performance of the F-35 over Beirut, again, bearing in mind that these have already buzzed Iran, we have further details on the clash between the Israeli Air Force and the Al-Quds Brigade of the Iranian Guard inside of Syria. Ongoing direct military clashes between Israel and Iran continue inside the Syrian border and most likely against Iran-backed, armed and uh, sponsored Hezbollah forces in Syria closer to the Lebanese border where they are trying to outflank the Israeli positions on the Golan Heights and in northern Galilee. Again, we've been speaking of this for some weeks, but the matter has not receded. Iran continues using cargo planes to build up the forces of Assad and to replenish Iranian positions inside of Syria with the approval of the Iranian government. Hezbollah and Iran are not up for negotiation officially, according to Assad, who says that the presence of Iran in Syria is something that is going to be ongoing, as is Hezbollah, and he sees that as something that he's not going to withdraw doing, despite Israeli pressure to do so, both militarily and through third parties diplomatically. At the same time, however, there is now reported this week in prophecy some evidence that Mr. Putin, and remember, Mr. Assad will do whatever Mr. Putin tells him, that Mr. Putin has to a degree given some cooperation to Israel and the United States in its actions against Iran. What could the reasons for this be in the shorter term? 
this would seem to go against any imminent suggestion of a Gog and Magog scenario, although not eliminating it by any means, eventually, or as an eventual possibility. Russia knows the Shia regime was religious fanaticism incarnate. And Russia has its own goals concerning oil and natural gas under the eastern Mediterranean. It has its own goals for a military position and a base of naval operations in the warm water ports of northern Syria. It does not want to be in a power play with Iran for political influence and control inside of Syria. This may be part of the reason. There is also an unspoken and ongoing Russian fear by Mr. Putin of Iranian sympathies, the Iranian secessionist Muslims, uh, where the civil war of the Ossetians was a human bloodbath and a human catastrophe that Mr. Putin is not keen to see replayed. But so the story continues. Political fallout in the United States this week in prophecy for the American left leaning, uh, for the American left leaning Jewish community. The absence, almost a protest, by leading Democrats from the U.S. Senate and Congress, including Chuck Schumer and Senator Blumenthal, has begun to tilt Jewish support in certain quarters for the Democratic Party. Only extreme left-wing Jews are as fully as committed to the Democratic Party as they once were in this life. So too are the pro-Hamas actions by certain members of the Democratic Party and the Linda Sassar Molly Cotling by the Democratic Party with this woman who is pro-Sharia, anti-human rights, anti-women's rights, is a spokesman for the American women's rights movement despite her opposition to women's rights in the Muslim world, including defending those who carry out forced general mutilation of underage Muslim girls. This woman is depraved, and she has stated publicly that one cannot be a supporter of Israel and a feminist, yet she remains a darling of the American left and of American feminism. Good evening, everyone. So I am really um, deeply honored and humbled uh, to be here on the stage with people who have been some of the staunchest allies of the communities that I come from, of Muslim communities, of Palestinian communities, of Arab American communities. We've spent a lot of time on the front lines together protecting each other, but also protecting other marginalized communities. And I'm so grateful to be on the same stage with you again tonight. So apparently, I'm the biggest problem for the Jewish community. <laughs> I am like the existential threat, apparently. And it really is very, confu I'm confused, literally every day. And I'm confused by people who actually don't know who I am, have never sat on a table with me, and for sure have never been anywhere near a social justice movement in these United States of America. And if they ever have been in space with me, including recently at the Left Forum for anyone who is here, one of the things I focused on at, at the Left Forum is I said to folks in the room, progressive folks, all pretty much down, I said to them, oftentimes when we come into conversation together, we always look at the ills of the things or the exterior to our progressive movement. What we really need to be doing is looking at the ills within the movement that we are a part of, which is not exclusive to anti-Semitism or to Islamophobia or to homophobia or to transphobia. My role here tonight was I was coming to speak to a progressive audience as a progressive leader in the progressive movement to say that we cannot dismantle anti-black racism, Islamophobia, homophobia, transphobia, every phobia and ism without also dismantling anti-Semitism. That intersectionality, as an intersectional movement organizer, and I've been doing intersectionality way before last year when everybody thought it was cool to talk about intersectionality. Thank you to Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw for giving us that term. 
Intersectionality is not about black people and white people organizing together or Jews and Muslims organizing together. That's not what intersectionality is. Intersectionality is all of us organizing at the intersections of oppression and seeing oppression connected. So anti-Semitism is one branch on a larger tree of racism. So you can't just address one branch, you gotta address all the branches together so we can get to the root of the problem. Apparently, the critics say, well, why are you all having a conversation about anti-Semitism? You're not experts in anti-Semitism and in Jewish communities. Well, first of all, all these people up here are Jews, if you didn't know. <laughs> and I'm the resident non-Jew on this panel. <laughs> and what I think is so ludicrous about that, which has basically been the argument for pretty much every the 199 plus op-eds that are out there because apparently people in the opposition have more times to write op-eds about us than about the administration but that's okay or health care or immigrant rights or let's pass the dream act maybe but anyway I, I digress <laughs> apparently it just really like i'm just dumbfounded it's kind of like saying we all got to be critical race theorists to say black lives matter or to talk about combating anti-black racism or saying you have to be a Muslim or an expert in Islam to want to combat Islamophobia. We would never say that about any other form of oppression. So why do we want to frame this conversation that only Jews or those who are experts in anti-Semitism can in fact want to combat anti-Semitism? That's like 99% of us are going to be like, guess we don't qualify, so we're not going to combat anti-Semitism. It's actually a disservice to Jews to try to frame this conversation in this way. Just in case it's not clear, I am unapologetically Palestinian American and will always be unapologetically Palestinian American. I'm also unapologetically Muslim American. And guess what? I'm also a very staunch supporter of the boycott divestment sanctions movement. Now, you can, you can tell me if I'm crazy. What other way am I supposed to be as a Palestinian American? What other positions do people expect me to have as a Palestinian American who's a daughter of immigrants who lived under military occupation and still has family in Palestine who live under military occupation? I should be expected to have the views that I hold. And the fact that people want to frame the way that I choose to show up in a movement they are denying my existence and my right to be an unapologetic Palestinian American who is not only a critic of the state of Israel, but I'm sure damn well a critic of the United States of America, and I always have been, even under the Obama administration. Now, what I'm here to say is this. I have always been an ally to Jewish communities, and one of the things that I've learned as a Muslim who belongs to a group of 1.8 billion people, that we ain't actually all the same. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that's the same in the Jewish community. So the confusion is, and I hope we're clarifying it for you tonight, that the Jewish community is also not a monolith. Not every single Jewish person that I've met sees their liberation or their Jewishness connected to the state of Israel. So the framing of this idea that in the progressive movement, somehow this imposition that we have to have is that all Jews, Israel, is inaccurate. It's false. The other thing that I want to say too is that if you want me to listen to what you have to say, if you want the progressive movement to be open-minded and hear the different arguments about how Zionism isn't all the same and not all Zionists are the same, and there's a lot of that conversation happening, what if you just showed up to the movement? What if, you, what if it was okay to show up to a social justice movement and say, you know what, this is not about me. Let me show up and work for black lives or undocumented immigrants. Let me roll up my sleeves for folks who are being impacted right now in this moment in such vicious ways. And guess what happens after you show up without putting conditions on your allyship and solidarity? Guess what happens? Eventually someone turns to you and says, who are you? Where did you come from? What is your story? That is what happens to me in the social justice mo movements. I have never showed up at a table and people who work with me on criminal justice reform, immigrant rights, healthcare access, you name it. I have never showed up to a table and said, before I sit down, raise your hand if you believe in the liberation of the Palestinian people. Raise your hand if you believe in BDS. That never happens because that's not how the movement works. 
The movement is a place to build transformative relationships. It's an opportunity for you to show up, give your all to another marginalized community, and by nature, people reciprocate that solidarity, people humanize you, and people ask you, what can I do for you? What are you being impacted by? Because I want to show up for you. So what I hope that you get from this conversation is this. I don't care who you are, Jewish or not Jewish, we all must commit to dismantling anti-Semitism. And that the existential threat resides in the White House, in the highest offices of these lands. And if what you're reading all day long, morning and night in the Jewish media is that Linda Sarsour and Minister Farrakhan are the existential threat to the Jewish community, something really bad is going to happen and we're going to miss the mark on it. So what I say to all of you here is that I am not looking for any approval from Zionist, right-wing Zionists, from Jewish Americans, from not Jewish Americans. I don't need anybody to invite me to the movement to dismantle anti-Semitism. I come here because I believe in it and it's the right thing to do for all of us. And guess what else is going to happen? By default, by default, even our opposition is going to benefit from the solidarity and the work that we do here. What they don't know is eventually they will be protected based on the work that we will do to risk our lives to protect the most marginalized people in this country, including our Jew Jewish sisters and brothers. Thank you. Woo! Woo! These things have begun to draw some traditional Democrats away from the support of the Democratic Party within the American Jewish community, but only some. It does show that the Democrats are wavering in the polls, and this is taking place in certain states and districts with a high Jewish vote. But since you brought up the subject of immigration again, it reminds me that, and as I was talking about uh, the religious groups and how they're concerned about feeding the hungry and the gospel of Matthew and the rest. 41 million people in our country are food insecure. Uh, we believe, that some of us who are attracted to the political arena, uh, to government and public service, uh, that uh, we're all God's children. There's a spark of divinity in every person on earth and that we all have to recognize that as we respect the dignity and worth of every person and as we recognize our responsibilities with that spark of divinity within us. And so when the President of the United States says about undocumented immigrants, these aren't people, these are animals, you have to wonder, does he not believe in the spark of divinity, the dignity and worth of every person? These are not people, these are animals. The President of the United States. Every day that you think you've seen it all, along comes another manifestation of why their policies are so inhumane and why we have to continue the debate, striving for bipartisanship with openness about what is, what is at stake and what the choices are, and to be unifying in every way possible. Calling people animals is not a good thing. Thank you. Bye-bye. For describing M13 gang members as animals those who decapitate people, gang rape women, etc., were referred to as animals by Mr. Trump. And this was particularly denounced <coughs> as horrific by Nancy Pelosi, saying all human beings have a divine spark in them, and that he's devaluing human life. Scripture speaks of some people as being animalistic. The mind of the beast was given to Nebuchadnezzar, he behaved like an animal. Pagans were called dogs in the Old Testament, Clavim, in Psalm 22. Jesus referred to Herod as a fox or a jackal because he behaved in that character, a vicious sneak. The scripture also tells us there are worthless people. Yes, man is made in God's image and likeness, but the divine spark is not in all people. Man is spiritually dead through sin and needs to be regenerated. Theologically, of course, Nancy Pelosi speaks a lot of nonsense, but she tried to make it a theological argument without knowing what she's talking about. If she's such a great theologian, why does she as a Roman Catholic support abortion and homosexual marriage? The woman is a hypocrite and a liar, obviously. Having said that, politically it backfired, it went nowhere, it went over like the proverbial. 
lead balloon. These people do behave in an animalistic fashion. And there is scriptural precedent for referring to people who behave animalistically as animals. Scripture, of course, also refers to corrupt political empires in the character of animals in the book of Daniel and so on. We cannot pinpoint anything direct. We can simply look at the polls, yet there does seem to be something taking shape as a result of the anti-Israel actions of the Democratic Party and the willingness of leading Jewish Democrats in the Senate and in politics generally to go along with it, to accommodate it. Mom Emanuel, mayor of Chicago, has said nothing. Uh, either has Chuck Schumer, either has Blumenthal. They all boycotted the opening of the American embassy in Jerusalem. And it was noticed by the Israeli public and press. We have to remember that while more than 80% of Republicans, a fair number of independents and also some libertarians are pro-Israel, only 27% of Democrats are sympathetic to Israel. It's becoming an extremely anti-Zionist and under the surface anti-Jewish party. What kind of Jew in his right mind would continue to support it? Unfortunately, there are many left-wing Jews who evidently are not in their right mind. Some are obviously coming to their senses, such as Alan Dershowitz, no longer able to deny the obvious writing on the wall. When we have Keith Ellis, co-chairman of the Democratic Party, an ally of Louis Farrakhan, and vehement anti-Semite, and so forth. Nonetheless, this has been the reality this week in prophecy, the aftermath of the liberal Jewish Democrat boycott of the opening of the American embassy in Jerusalem. Remember, support for Israel is a minority position now among Democrats. Please pray that more American Jews open their eyes and leave this party, just as some blacks are beginning to open their eyes and leave this party. Again, we pray this not on the basis of political activism, but on the basis of we want God to bless America. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. France puts itself in further peril, courtesy of Obadiah, verse 15. The French foreign minister, in protest of the Israeli self-defensive actions along the Gaza border, has canceled the trip to Israel. The usual French policy of pandering to people who hate them, who've carried out weeks of riots and burnings in the banlieue, and one murderous terrorist rampage after another in Paris itself, running over human beings with vehicles in Marseille, etc. Yet the reaction of France has been to genuflect to Mecca and pander to the radicals who, in the name of Mecca, perpetrate this. Now, we do know that there are moderate Muslims who do not support this and say, do not do it in the name of Mecca, our religion. The radicals, however, do, and that is who the government of Mr. Emmanuel Macron and his foreign minister are pandering to this week in prophecy. Let us continue. It was announced by Buckingham Palace this week in prophecy and by the British Foreign Office that Prince William is to make a visit next month to Israel, to Jordan, and to what is being called the occupied territories. Again, this we protest. An Irishman cannot occupy County Tipperary. If I was to use his standard of occupation, I would have to say that Belfast, Belfast, Northern Ireland, is an occupied territory. Many people in Ireland, most people in Ireland would. Some people in Britain would say that Northern Ireland is British occupied. But by the same standards, they're saying that, at least by the same standards, if not less standards. The royal visit was announced using the term occupied territories. An Apache cannot occupy Arizona, and an Irishman cannot occupy County Tipperary, where the Buckingham Palace and the British Foreign Ministry of Theresa May likes it or not. Boris Johnson would have come to his senses. 
Well, let us continue looking at what is transpiring this week in prophecies. We don't know if it's a temporary dip or if it is the beginning of a trend, but despite attempts to ramp up oil production by Iran and in Venezuela, oil prices have finally begun to marginalize and perhaps recede. Let's hope that this trend continues. In the meanwhile, however, four major fires are blazing as we speak inside of Israel. They were launched by incendiary de devices dropped from kites flown out of the Gaza Strip. מלבה את זה, מריצה את זה For once, breaking with UN norms UN General Secretary Guillermo Gutierrez has finally voiced the condemnation of the actions of Hamas understanding that they were provocative in the Israeli response that was necessitated as an act of self-defense. It is about time, but let us hope and pray it is not simply a one-off. May these fires be brought under control quickly. We pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus. This week in prophecy. The situation continues with the aftermath of President Trump's withdrawal of Mr. Obama's sellout to Iran and the illegal treaty that Mr. Obama concorded, giving over $150 billion to Iranian terror driving regime, to, a, to an Iranian terror funding and terror sponsoring and terror perpetrating regime as the price of getting it. Thank God Mr. Trump has done this. But there are ramifications, and the Europeans continue to cry and pout. Not all of them, but some of them. It was admitted this week by Mr. Macron in Paris that it is a dilemma for France and for Europe. Heiko Meso, the German foreign minister, who will be soon returning from Argentina via the United States to Germany, has made similar statements saying there's only so much Germany can do concerning the American actions. What is clear, once again, is that Mr. Trump is no Obama. It is America first. He's going to put us and our allies, as he sees the needs of the allies, before political considerations and pandering to people who don't like us or even hate us. He has stood up where others have not. He's not been a coward and a hypocrite like most of his recent predecessors. That being said, he again requires our prayers, as does Vice President Prince, Pence and Mr. Pompeo, also, of course, our National Security Advisor, John Bolton, and the new Directress of the CIA, may God bless her as well, in her task in the war against radical Islamic terror. And the maniacal, uh, tyranny of the regime in North Korea. 
as well as dealings with the sponsors of these things, which include, to a degree, China. Having said that, Iran has given a formal response by Ayatollah Khamenei. Again, in Iran, the word of the clergy, of the mullahs, trumps anything said by the political establishment, by the elected or pseudo-elected government, or by the diplomatic court. He has given conditions for Iran to remain in the so-called Obama deal. But his demands are almost, to a rational mind, unbelievable. He said there will be no missile negotiations. Iran can continue to develop medium and long-range missiles capable of developing nuclear warheads, biological warheads, chemical warheads, but it's not on the agenda for any negotiation. You can't negotiate it. It was one of the complaints that both Israel and the Trump administration had concerning the Obama sellout. It was also a major concern of Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. The second condition, that there would be no inclusion or any consideration of Iran's other activities in the Middle East. In other words, their presence in Syria and their sponsorship of terror in Gaza, Lebanon, and elsewhere. Yes, we're sponsoring terror, but you've got to continue the deal anyway and give us money and do business with us on our terms, and it's not up for discussion if we want to finance terror, even though your own citizens may be the victims of it in some attacks. This was his second condition. His third condition was that Europe guarantees to buy up any surplus oil not being sold because of the American embargoes and take up any pressure on the Iranian economy, and that Europe guarantees to do this. Put up the money, buy our oil, do not let us suffer any economic ramifications from the actions of Mr. Trump. Now, obviously, this is a political and an economic and a financial impossibility for the Europeans. These demands are outrageous, if not ridiculous. Yet there are left-wing lunatics, some in the United States, but quite a number in Europe, who'd be willing to pander to this. Okay, you can continue sponsoring and funding terror, just don't back out of the deal. Okay, you can continue developing missiles that can hit Europe, but just don't back out of the deal. Yes, okay, you can continue doing anything you want. It's not up for negotiation. Just give us the money. Guarantee you're going to buy this and we'll do it. We'll stay in the agreement, says Iran. Okay, says many voices in the European left. This is absurd. Missile development? They don't want any change in verification inspections? And they certainly do not want their other Middle East activities, that is, in Syria, or in their sponsorship of terror and terror surrogate organizations to be up for negotiation. These things will not be negotiated. No negotiations whatsoever. Quite a situation. It is hard to believe that we have had sellouts People like John Kerry, John Brennan, Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, doing this, paying $400 million in hostage money, ransom to release captured U.S. sailors, $150 billion plus to a regime they know is funding terror. Anything, all the concessions you want. Just give us a deal where there's no verification that you have to keep it. No verification we can rely on. Go ahead, continue with the terror sponsorship. This was Obama. This was Hillary Clinton. 
And there are industrial interests in Europe who want the European governments to do the same thing. Europe is now under pressure from Iran and from certain corporate and industrial interests to alienate itself publicly from the American position. These companies, however, themselves know the dire consequences for their own interests economically of not being able to trade with or in the United States will become extremely damaging. And the governments of those European countries are the weak, the spineless governments of most of Europe. Eastern Europe is different. The people of Poland and these other countries have more courage and integrity. Under Theresa May, the Tory party has lost its backbone. And in continental Europe, they never had a backbone to lose. Angela Merkel, of course, panders to Islamic aggression, as does Mr. Macron. Mr. Trump says no. This is America first. He's drawn the line. He stood with Israel. He stood with America. And he's actually stood, in the view of many people, with the long-term interests of Europe itself. Europe is a country made up of many countries in the EU. They think it's a federal state that it isn't. That needs to be told what to do because it doesn't want to take responsibility for its own future with its unelected bureaucrat government. They want to hide on back of the American umbrella, as France did during the Cold War, and still assert their own autonomy. Mr. Trump said, enough is enough. South Korea, likewise, running trade circles with the United States. The United States was only willing under Mr. Trump to go so far in placating the demands of the South Korean government, although we certainly understand their desires to end the Korean War. But Mr. Trump would not do so at the expense of playing hopscotch with Kim Jong-un. All of these things have come into play this week in prophecy, all of them, including the Iranian demand that Europe be the guarantor for any lost revenues as a result of Mr. Trump's withdrawal of America from Mr. Obama's sellout. And so it continues, week after week after week. Meanwhile in Israel, there has been a readdressing of a law that would have allowed the Rosh Hashanah, the Prime Minister, to unilaterally declare war in certain circumstances. That has now been rescinded and is back firmly in the hands of the Security Cabinet. One person should not have to say so to launch a nuclear strike unless it is a counter-strike when you are on the nuclear attack itself, much less to declare war. It is a buttressing and a reinforcement of the democratic principles that any democratic nation should have. We believe that this adjustment in the Israeli law and its revision is a good policy. But the fact that such a law was proposed and was coming into effect that would have given that kind of almost autonomous and autocratic power to the prime minister in the time of emergency without consultation of cabinet authorities shows how serious the Israelis feel in the face of the Iranian threat. Something is not bound to happen. Something has already begun to happen this week in prophecy. How will this end? What will it come to? As we've been saying and repeating for months, Daniel chapter 10. This week in prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless you and thank you so much for listening.